Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, welcome to uh, VMDO Presents Games and Music, Your Perfect Soundtrack. Um, today, uh, I am joined by my wonderful panellists. Um, to my left, we have chiptune artist Chipzel, um, followed by Sebastian Wolf from Materia Collective, uh, Fabian Malabello from Otherworld Agency and Boss Battle Records, and Mason Lieberman from Tencent. Um, my name is Yasmin Nagabi. I'm from Media Arts Lawyers. I am a senior lawyer at the firm and I represent uh, uh, all types of people in the creative industries, including uh, game developers and um, composers. Um, so I guess to get things started off, uh, I'll give some context to what this panel is about and what we're trying to achieve. Um, there's obviously no doubt of the importance um, music plays, uh, music and sound design plays uh, in the gaming experience. Um, and today we want to delve into some of the complexities surrounding um, collaboration between <coughs> musicians and game developers and hopefully provide a better understanding as to the landscape um, with a view to foster better or more collaboration between creative people in the gaming industry. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Um, so, I think we'll have enough time for questions at the end, but if anyone has a burning question um, at the beginning, please raise your hand. Um, it's a small room, so just shout out. Um, and uh, otherwise, I think we should get cracking. Um, can I just have a poll? Who in the room is a game developer? Awesome. Welcome. And who is a musician, sound composer, uh, a sound designer, or um, composer? Awesome. Okay, cool. Welcome to all. So, to start off with, and I'll open it to everybody, um, what do you consider is the biggest hurdle for game developers when working or thinking of working together with um, musicians, composers, and sound designers? Uh, biggest hurdle when working with musicians, composers, or sound designers? Um, honestly, I would say that communication is always the biggest challenge. Um, when, especially at Tencent, um, to do world's shortest introduction, I'm the senior game audio coordinator, so hiring, retention, management of people, all of that's my problem. Um, we're not just looking for talented, brilliant musicians, because there are plenty of those. We can find those no matter who we go with. We're looking for world-class communicators who can take direction well, who can understand and interpret feedback, who can work quickly, and who can you know, create great results, who know kind of the stuff we're looking for and how to articulate it potentially even better than we do. Uh, when you're a composer working in video games, especially if you're working with game developers who don't have a musical background of any kind, um, you're almost like a translator. Your real job is to speak video game, or if you're a film composer, speak film, and then say, oh, you're asking for this to be big and action-y and you want kind of like a Halo-y vibe. Okay, well, what you really mean is you're looking for something orchestrally based you're looking for something that's kind of in an epic vein. Maybe we're looking at hybrid orchestral production in this instance, and then it's your job to go and make the thing and maintain schedule, budget, and everything else. Fabian, whose responsibility do you think that is to interpret what the brief is? Is it up to the game designer or is it collaborative? It's, it's up to the person who knows how to adapt the language, I think. So most of the time it's up to the composer or the sound designer to explain to the developer what they mean in a way that the developer understands. Because the developers don't know the music industry, they don't write music, they don't think about things in you know musical terms. And if we're like, you know, so this legato you know, thing here, and then they're just like, I don't speak Latin or anything. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, so that's when you have to be like, you know, when it does that big slidey bit in there, <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, slides are in there. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, I think that it really does come down to, to, to go back to the question, it's, um, it's a language issue and a communication issue. Um, actually, yeah, language is prob probably um, secondary to communication, that is, because we work with plenty of um, developers internationally, 
uh, we work with plenty of composers internationally as well who speak English as a second, third or fourth language. And um, it's never an issue as long as there is sufficient communication between them to then understand what they mean. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, much, much of what I was going to say because I've been that person that has to translate. Um, one of the ways that I would usually get around it is like asking the developer for as many references as possible, like things that they're going for, um, which usually works, but then sometimes you get a whole mix and you're kind of like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> this, these are five different things. Um, but yeah, communication is a big one um, because obviously it's like, it's a collaborative effort, but you hold the responsibility of the emotion of the game. Um, and so it's trying to understand what the game developer's mindset is there to try and make sure that you can do a good job, but also put your like own unique spin on it and sort of keep the developer happy um, as well as the player. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, that's it. And from maybe from a licensing perspective, Sebastian, do you or licensing or commissioning. Right, right. Uh, so from a, I guess, broader like music industry, music business perspective, um, as everyone has already said, sort of a shared vocabulary and shared context between the different industries helps uh, a grand amount. So anyone working in games, everyone here is working also in the music industry. Everyone here is also working in the li licensing and rights industry. Everyone here is also working in the tech industry. So, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be necessarily an expert in every single one of those verticals, but having context beyond your expertise helps you become a better communicator and helps you have shared context, which of course makes you a better you know, team player and part of a you know, broader organization. Yeah, excellent. Um, so at yesterday's breakfast, um, I don't know if anyone was uh, in attendance, but um, you mentioned that there are more works being commissioned than licensed today. Um, why do you think this model works best for games? I think I think it very much depends on on the game. Um, I would say somewhere at least ninety five percent of all music in games is created custom for the game. You know, when you think about you know an interactive experience, is very much personal. It has to be unique. So in some cases, production libraries might might be a good fit. In some cases, you know, synchronization, you know, existing music might fit, might fit the environment. You know, if you have a game that's based, you know, in the 1980s, you probably want to have uh, music from that era that helps contextualize and helps ground the reality and the world that has been built. But you know, if you're creating new, new unique experiences, new worlds, you know, you want to have some unique music that really con uh, contextualizes it and again, for that new world, grounds that. Right. I could probably. Oh, you were about to go. Oh, no, it's sorry. Okay. You can go first. Fine. Beat you. <laughs> um, I think the easiest uh, way to understand why it's mainly original commission uh, music is because you have to hit, um, well, the music has to hit things such as like, you know, emphasizing the mechanics of the game, the pacing of the game, the atmosphere and the aesthetic of the game, the narrative elements. So like any kind of repeating motif, you're not going to find that in a production library 95% of the time if you need to like hit all these points. And so it just makes more sense to have somebody create something specific to that moment in the game because it's such a multifaceted interactive experience. Music just, yeah, it's impossible to find something to sync. And because it's linear, you know, there's there's no, you know, yeah, time it's limit as to how long this piece of work is, needs to be looped yeah. or, you know. Sometimes it's reactive as well or procedurally mm -hmm. generated or yeah. Yeah. Another really important consideration, um, especially once you get onto the higher tier of game development, uh, music isn't really about music. It's about branding and it's about marketing. What we're really thinking about when we're hiring a composer, when we're hiring anyone to create these assets, um, is you know, first of all, will this be a return on investment? Is this going to push the game forward? or are we just you know, slapping a Band-Aid because we thought we needed sound? Generally speaking, on larger titles, it's not about that. It's about actually pushing the game forward in some meaningful way. Another reason why video games often are more capable of having original commission music than say film or TV or advertising in particular might is because we are often dealing with longer timelines that we're working with. 
when you're working, because I came from a TV background where you're dealing with, you know, 40 minutes of music in a week or in advertising where you might get three hours for your pitch and it has to be a track you've already written. Um, when you're working in video games and a long form media that you might be on a specific project in like, you know, the year's length range, uh, that gives you a lot more flexibility to pursue an original soundtrack and to be thinking of it in those terms. You're not trying to just solve a tiny problem, you're trying to push the entire project forward. And it's great that composers can have that kind of an impact. They can be involved in that kind of long, uh, that uh, large scale decision making. Maeve, what's been your experience? Um, so mine is mostly just from like the indie market. I usually just work in indie games and usually uh, you'll have a lot, like a small team. So everybody's kind of wearing a lot of hats, um, which can be a really good thing, but Definitely, like I would agree with what Sebastian was saying and that it's like, I find it much more interesting to bring people on and then have them put their own unique spin on it because then it becomes this true collabor collaborative effort um, where you get this mix of personalities into like one new form of media that's like totally unique. Well, one of the observations from film and TV is that it's music is often considered an afterthought or, you know, you've got this much budget, meh. Let's see what we can get for that budget. And it's, it's um, you know, commissioned or licensed right mm. at the very end. So what I'm hearing today is that, you know, it is more collaborative mm -hmm. and it's you're starting quite early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say that that's much... that's You can tell when something has been picked from music libraries, you know? So if you have, like, your composer working... Uh, like, it doesn't need to be at the very start of your project, but it's good to sort of at least have them on board so that they sort of see the development and get to sort of have an idea of what the game is going to be. Um, and then you can sort of form your opinions of, like, where it should go and what the theme should be and what, what is the emotion. Um, and it's much more interesting that way, I think. So how much influence do you have over that? It totally depends. Um, I've done projects where I've had full responsibility for everything and thus had to sort of come up with the theme of the game and kind of like push uh, the narrative aspect just so that I could get to work. Um, and then I've had uh, projects where uh, the developer had a very specific set of rules of like what they wanted from the game. So it just, this is the thing, you have to be very versatile, you have to be very flexible and just be able to, um, take orders, but also be able to uh, stand strong in that like you can offer something to this project and it couldn't be different and unique. You just have to sort of slip it in there somewhere, <laughs> you know? So it comes to understanding your value, which is uh, a brilliant segue to um, talking about fees. Can we talk about fees, points? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we sure can, and I have a feeling like, we're probably going to have a lot to say. <laughs> there really isn't any money in music, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's no money, everyone money. go home, leave it for me. It's just exposure forever. <laughs> I have so much exposure, but... <laughs> um, so, yeah, with Tencent, we usually pay about 40,000 exposure bucks per minute of music. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, project uh, fees and scales can vary dramatically. Um, there are freelance composers, and I wish they weren't charging these rates because they deserve better, who are charging $200 a minute. And there are AAA composers charging on a regular end, not even the highest end, up in the 4,000 a minute range. And you know, it can go higher than that. There are people who are negotiating <coughs> points on the game. Like, it's not the wild west, but it's a very open, you know, whatever value you're bringing, that's what you're charging at the end of the day. Um, right. I think I think one of the most important considerations is that you know any any work that you do, <coughs> there there's always going to be a bundle of rights, and you can negotiate more than just oh I'm receiving X dollars um, per minute of music, or X dollars in flat rate. You know every every potential negotiation point has a lot of value. So for example, if it's a small team, they can't afford to pay sort of the standard. Thousand fifteen hundred dollars per minute rate per minute of music. Maybe you can negotiate. Okay, maybe I get ten fifteen percent um, of the game revenue after recoup. Um, maybe I get to retain uh, ownership of the masters or the publisher. Maybe I get to put out the soundtrack on my own. Um, 
the most useful resource, I think, is the Game Audio Industry Survey. It's published by Brian Schmidt and the Game Soundcon team. It's publicly available. It's an annual survey. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think it has about a thousand or so game audio professionals, mostly from the United States, Canada, and Europe, um, who contribute data statistics about um, you know, gender and diversity splits, about salaries, about in-house rates, about buyout rates, PRO affiliations. Um, much more data than you know, I'm probably able to bring to this panel by my own, but definitely have a look at that, look at sort of what what is common, and then also decide sort of where your, um, what your value is uh, for the stage in your career. And for example, if you get to work on a larger game title that could potentially springboard and accelerate your career, does a pay cut make sense? So, you know, definitely understand your own value and your own priorities in terms of, you know, a short-term goal and a long-term goal. You know, you can't continue making music if you can't pay rent, but also don't undervalue yourself. Um, mm -hmm. A if, minute if, of produced music. Not, not like that so would be incredible. I wish amazing. we were charging. Oh my God. Yeah, no. I when I was a freelancer, I charged four hundred thousand dollars an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really wish. <laughs> yeah, video game music is lucrative. Important. It's not that lucrative. Yeah, yeah. I got my brand Very printed on Giorgio Armani. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, Emporio, sir. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Go get in your Ferrari, um, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're two Ferraris. I, I, I'm joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Something else is you can get pretty uh, creative with your negotiation points. We often even just say, like, look, I know you're uh, an indie. We can't, you know, bleed a stone. We're not going to do that. There's no point. Um, but maybe what you can do to help us is in the main menu screen, just have a button that links to our soundtrack. And then everybody who plays it just goes to Bandcamp. So sometimes that's how you make your money. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good one. Um, so, like, I have been in games for six or seven years now, but I've been making music for, like, 10 or 12. And it's mostly been uh, trial and error because I've represented myself. So I have fallen trap to uh, undervaluing myself. And the worst thing is, is that when it comes to games, is that these things can be in, in development for supposedly, like, three months or something, and then it stretches out for, like, a year and a half or whatever. Um, and then they have production costs to make back, and you were promised a revenue share. Like, mm -hmm. you have to account for all these sorts of things because they will pop up. So you, this is, it almost then becomes a security, your your fee and your and your agreement that you make uh, in the future because you start to learn from your mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it, a lot of it is. It'll it, it mines will still wi wildly vary depending on who. I'm working with, that's always a big one, because if you are trustworthy, then that's okay, I trust you, and I know that this agreement is solid. Um, so there's a couple, there's so many different uh, variables that sort of change uh, how much you charge, but definitely do not charge $200 per minute. That's far too little. <laughs> right, and you also brought up a good point about you know working with people that you know and trust. Um, I think as we're, uh, you know, if you're if you're just getting started or in the early stages of your career, you know, you're not able to afford that luxury most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, which is why it's always important, you know, have people who have gone through this process before. Work with an attorney, work with an agent if you have the luxury to do that. Um, definitely don't sign contracts that have words that you don't understand. Um, also, sign contracts before you start a single a single minute of work because it's always more difficult to change your negotiation agreement after. The game is out. For and definitely, if you can't afford a lawyer, at least have some other people look over it and just double check it for you as well. Yeah, but because contracts in themselves can be um, full of jargos. Like There's very, very exciting words in contracts, yes. and they mean many things. <laughs> Hence, forthright. <laughs> Hence, Hence forthright. Hence forthright. Hence forthright. Hence forthright. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's what we're paid to do. Um, no, but we, we're lawyers do obviously try to. Um, 
uh, these days, or at least our firm does, write in plain English um, and try to empower our clients to understand what they're signing, so to make it easier for um, future. But what you raised is an excellent point about leverage. Um, you know, if you don't sign an agreement at the beginning, you are losing <coughs> a significant amount of leverage. Um, and, you know, not just from the composer's side, but from the game developer's side. Unless, um, if you're, you know, if the game developer is seeking um, to control the rights, um, they won't have, you, you know, you won't have control of those rights unless you have an assignment in writing which is signed by the composer. Um, so it's in the best interests of all parties to make sure that there is an agreement at the beginning, that there is an understanding as to um, what, um, you know, what the expectations and obligations are of the parties. Um, I would just yeah. personally say that if, you're, if you feel like you're uh, an audio person and you're, you're in the early stages, personally I would never give out the rights. Um, I wouldn't go for exclusive deals or anything because that is, that is your music. Like that's all that you've, you've got thus far. Um, buying out rights is kind of like, that's a, still a big deal for me. Um, so I would say just be careful if people are actually looking for the rights. They owe you a lot of money if they want that. So that that's that's a really important point as well. I mean, in coming from a broader music industry background, for example, you know, there's always the recommendations to don't sell your masters, don't sell your rights, and I think there are definitely price points where that is adequate and appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, for the broader game industry, you know, the music exists to support the game. You know, the music, however, is a separately monetizable asset. So, for example, if you have a million streams on Spotify for a track, that's somewhere between 5000 and $7,000, depending on the position of Venus and the moon cycle and goodness knows what else. Um, royalties can be pretty complicated. However, they can also be pretty lucrative. So you want to be in, again, you want to be in a position where you can leverage your position and your understanding as a composer or if you're a game company and a game studio that purchases these rights, that you have a broader understanding of the music industry, where instead of simply owning those assets, um, where you can leverage those, you can monetize those. Um, and it's, uh, the, the hill I'm willing to die on is that every game deserves a soundtrack release, and it should be on Spotify and Bandcamp and Apple Music and everything, um, because you do have fan bases and Ultimately, a soundtrack can be one of the most successful marketing tools for the game. Yeah, it's like that's your portfolio, you know. And if you don't have the rights to your own portfolio, how do you keep pushing yourself forward? It's impossible. So, well, let's just quickly segue into what you mentioned before: is the bundle of rights. Um, you know, it's it's often the term that's used as regards to copyright. Um, Sebastian, do you want to talk about, you know, the various rights that um, can be separated? Uh, in negotiating a deal? Um, absolutely, and Fabian can speak to that a little bit as well. Um, I'll just preface, I'm not an attorney. Um, none of this is legal advice. <laughs> I am, though. <laughs> <laughs> but she's not your attorney, and this is general <laughs> advice. This does not constitute attorney-client <laughs> privilege. Great, disclaimers out of the way. Um, so with, um, this with, is with music, was, was this billed, Alex? Um, so for, for music, uh, sort of the, the big first understanding is that um, a sound recording, so like a you know, piece of music that you listen to has essentially two rights. So you have like the musical composition aspect, um, the melody, chords, lyrics, if they're included, and then the actual recording of it. Um, and those are both two separate copyrights that you can potentially exploit. Um, you know, my, my company, Material Collective, we work a lot with music merchandise, we create vinyl, CDs, sheet music, we do royalty collection on all of those rights and how those are exploited across the digital and physical landscapes. And there are a lot of royalties that fall off. Um, in terms of bundle of rights, you know, if you're a composer and you get contracted to work on a game, um, <coughs> I, think, I think it's best to sort of uh, split three, three standard types of uh, game agreements, of game music agreements up, where you have your indie core, um, you have your funded indie triple I, and then your <laughs> mid core. <or> so <laughs> mid core, that's what it is, and then your triple A and your high end. So on the high end, it's pretty common. Um, I think it's about ninety eight percent of those deals. It's a complete buyout. It's a passive transfer. 
you know, the game studio and the company that own all of those rights. Um, the ranges for, you know, per minute is about a you know, thousand per minute per game, all the way up till yeah, they I decide mean, it's appropriate. <coughs> However, I, it gets pretty, it depends on the specific composer, but I mean, anywhere from a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars per minute to I've seen six, seven thousand for yeah. some things. Like, I've seen some fascinating figures before. Exactly. But again, you know, slightly touched on a little bit earlier about the bundle of rights. Okay, maybe you receive only a thousand dollars a minute, but you get 50% of the soundtrack revenue, or you receive five points in the game. Um, so the, the idea that you, you could also receive royalties on the game as a composer or as a contributor. Um, the way I like to contextualize it is that you're investing your time and you might not receive an immediate return of that investment. Like, okay, you don't get your $50,000 or something for a couple of minutes of music, but you might be receiving royalties later on. You know, after the game's expenses have recouped, maybe in five, 10 years, all of a sudden you start getting royalty payments every quarter. It's what we refer to as the long tail. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've done some pretty interesting things before where uh, major, major publishers have just simply had to do a land grab, take all the rights to even the game, they bought out the IP of the game. So we, you know, say, okay, we can get behind this, that's fine, this is a price, but we want to be the music publishers, we want to be the record label, and we'll keep 100% of the revenue on both sides. And they go, yeah, that's fine. So we just get it licensed back to us as well, even though they own it. So it can kind of, yeah, there's a lot of, versatility with, you know, what's on offer, I guess, with the rights. Right, and uh, probably another thing to mention as well is that, you know, if if someone else owns a piece of intellectual property, like, you know, a sound recording or a musical composition, um, they might not be the exclusive party that gets to use that or monetize mm -hmm. it or exploit it. You know, like Fabian was saying, you know, they can grant you as a composer back a license and say, okay, you're the one who gets to put it up on Bandcamp. You know, you're going to be the one to monetize it and collect royalties from uh, performing rights organizations or you know, whatever else. So um, I think buyouts and uh, just work for hire agreements do have a price. Um, mm -hmm. Just make sure that you do have someone at the negotiation table who can say, okay, that's all fine and good and this is a good price. However, we need these seven additional things. And you know, it just comes yeah. back down to like knowing your value, I think. Totally, and a, th a thing that I'll just highlight there is, you know, for the composers in the room or, you know, the game developers, um, to understand that um, composers actually do assign their future rights to Apple Amcos as regards to public performance uh, income. Um, so it's um, essential for that to at least be carved out to allow the composer to still collect that income as regards to public performance. Um, so on that note, um, can you guys maybe have, you know, speak about the changing landscape of publishing and collecting societies? Um, do, you, do you receive any, um, you know, public performance income from your works? So um, I touched on recently, like I am, feel like I'm wearing a lot of hats and I feel like I've been struggling by on my own for a long time. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm the manager and the cleaner and the composer and the uh, accountant at the, you know, the top office. I, I relate to that a lot. Yeah. Like, you mm -hmm. know, the company's seven people and I can finally do all the things I've wanted to do forever, which is HR and accounting and <laughs> emails and project <laughs> management. Spreadsheets, yeah. All the spreadsheets. <laughs> um, in, in regards to publishing, I think the, uh, the biggest important takeaway for both game developers and um, musicians, composers, anyone tangentially involved in uh, using or monetizing some of those those assets, there's always going to be money on the table. Um, you know, there are collection societies and music publishers and the laws from different territories vary drastically. So it's very important to have, um, to work with a music partner or an agent or an attorney or someone who can help you manage those rights. Um, you know. From our end, you know, the Material Collective has a publishing division. Uh, we help in collecting some of those royalties that fall off. You know, for example, for per million plays on Spotify, um, 
you know, you might be receiving four to six thousand dollars in master revenue. However, on the publishing side, uh, performance royalties that fall off depending on the territory, and mechanical royalties that fall off depending on the territory, and that can add up to a pretty substantial amount, about 15 to 20 percent of additional revenue. Now, the, the music industry has had a few centuries to sort of find its ground, and while most of copyright law is still based on the Gutenberg printing press. <laughs> I thought it was um, King Henry the VIII. Yeah, <laughs> Some changes. Wasn't um, it King Henry? He was like, you have to pay me for you to release your theatrical play, right? That's I think that's how that copyright right. started. I really thought that was about disaster. to be a joke. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, no, no, I'm real. serious. Yeah. Not about King Henry of Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had to pay King Henry for my experimental jazz album. Yeah. It was <laughs> did, did he approve? Um, he wasn't super into it. <laughs> okay, so like 99 out of 100 nobles were impressed. I can't go Great. back to England or I will We're be sorry. executed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry about that. It's <laughs> gotten very nerdy. We're oh. composers, not stand-up comedians. <laughs> um, so, so in regards to publishing royalties, they do fall off, and they sit on a table, and depending on the territory, yeah. they might expire. Mm -hmm. So... You know, if, if, you, if you don't necessarily have the capacity or the knowledge or the interest in collecting those, that's fine. It's simply money that's owed to you that will expire. I think Ed Sheeran's probably the highest paid video game composer in that regard then, because he will just oh, get absolutely. most of it. Yeah. Um, in, in some cases and in some territories, you know, if there are Spotify streams for which there are royalties allocated, if those are not collected, um, some of those may be distributed based on market share. So, mm -hmm. um, as a as a good friend put it recently, you know, collect your royalties or Katy Perry gets your money, yeah. which is mm -hmm. fine. Good for her. She she worked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so Fabian, what opportunities um, are there for people that currently work in the music industry um, to get into the gaming industry? So most people immediately think um, writing music for games. Um, it's a pretty hard market to enter simply because it is a pretty long um, long road to you know, building your networks and making a lot of friends in the industry and getting those opportunities. Sometimes it's, you could be the hardest working person in that regard and it still just comes down to luck at the end of the day. Uh, so I often tell people who are interested in whoever wants to say write music for games like that's not the only entry point if you're a session musician um somebody came up to me at high score and said uh oh you know I'm, i play uh, double bass and electric bass and really want to write music for games and i'm like well, why don't you make the composers your client and do session work for them on video games i'm pretty sure that's what mason did yeah as well, so that's right? yeah. literally how i got my start um nowadays you know I've been a composer and recording artist for anime, video games. Now I work at Tencent. But when I started off, I was just a cello player. Um, before I had done any writing, I recorded for other composers, starting you know, fairly small and getting fairly large. I recorded on the Smash Bros. soundtrack. Um, I found that it was a great way, like if you could get your foot in the door in any capacity, then if you could prove your worth in that way, you were trusted. It didn't matter really what you were doing that got you in. Once you were friends with people, once you'd made that human connection, if you had the competency to be doing more work, you'd get the extra work. When I started working for Rooster Teeth on Ruby, like I started that as a cello soloist before becoming a composer. When I started working on the Beyblade franchise, I started that as a guitarist before becoming a composer. And that has like gone on and repeated itself dozens and dozens of times in my career, you know, as short as it's been comparatively. Mm. And some people are, I say, like really uh, quite competent at mixing their own work. Uh, they could offer their services to other composers who aren't as good. For instance, um, people who just have like really high quality production shops, you just say, I'm happy to, you know, re, I like to change all the instrumentation of your soundtrack to make it sound like you're good, you know? <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, there, there's plenty of uh, ways of you. positioning yourself. I too like David Lynn. Thank you. <laughs> I actually don't know who that is. Ne Dope. That was a necrobarista joke. Dope. All right. Um, so, 
Uh, I lost what I was saying. Back to you, Yasmin. Yeah. <laughs> How's the weather there, Yasmin? No, no, you were making a really great point about how there are lots of, lots of different ways that you can gain entry into the gaming industry and it doesn't necessarily need to be as a composer. Um, you can, you know, you, you can be a mixer, you can be a session musician, uh, you can, um, you know, do sound design. Um, there are, yeah. yeah. I just yeah. remembered what I was going to say, which is, um, funnily enough, branding is, uh, like every single person who enters the games industry as a composer or session musician or a mixing engineer, they have to treat themselves like an artist. You know, it's them, their brand, they have to stand out in that way as well. Uh, so I tell people, you know, say that you're a session musician for video games as like the context of what you are. Blah, 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 person, bass player for video games. And it's just like, all right, I guess he's the guy I go to for bass on my game. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. you that just works. find a, an angle and then you'll just continue to build that. Is that you, yeah. Sorry, is that whole thing as well where it's like if you th feel like you have something to offer to video games, never say that you're aspiring. Because if, oh yeah. if yeah. you're a musician, you're a musician. You're not an aspiring musician. If you can write music, you're a musician. You know? Congrats, you're here, you're a professional. You're no yes. longer aspiring. Congratulations. <laughs> I still don't know Congrats what I'm on doing. Congrats like, <laughs> Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Imposter syndrome never leaves, you know? Um, you'll always feel like that someone's better than you or that like you could do better, yada, yada, yada. And it'll just, that'll just come over time. But you mentioned about um, different roles, even like uh, completely outside of music, like all of us DJs need management as well. And like people who like to do spreadsheets and people who like to do, <laughs> like I look at a spreadsheet and I'm like, oh God. Please don't use the S word in front <laughs> of Sebastian. <laughs> there was a spreadsheet panel two days ago. <laughs> I, I, I was so happy. <laughs> it was, I the, was, it was one there. of the best panels I've been to. <laughs> you just are like, it was really good. Someone else understood. It only required traveling around the world to find them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right. The the industry is not just, you yes, know, it's, it's a, a business now, you know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So how can we collaborate uh, or how can we facilitate more collaboration um, between, you know, the music industry <coughs> and the gaming industry? Mason, take I'll it I'll take away. that one on. Yeah. Um, so you want to work in AAA or indie games, meet developers. Um, there are developers in this room. Swarm them when the panel is done. Don't let them leave the room. Uh, <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> oh, no, we're filming this. Um, no, uh, in all seriousness, um, if you want to be a part of the community, be a part of it. Join like, you know, show up at events like this. Travel to Game Developer Conference in San Francisco if you can. Go to PAX Australia. Walk up to developers who are playing their games, who are showcasing them in like bars at local meetups. Like, go out of your way to just make friends. It's never about trying to be, it's never about introducing yourself and saying, hi, I'm a composer, do you need music? Because every developer in this room will tell you they get like 30 of those emails a day. That is not going to make you stand out. What makes you stand out is being a human being that they can relate to. It's the exact same thing for Victorian musicians as it is for anyone else. Go up, play someone's game. If you like it, make a friend. Find out what they're interested in, and if you guys actually connect, you know, you might spend like four or five hours talking about like fly fishing or playing Super Smash Brothers or, you know, any number of things where you might not talk about music once, but you know what? That developer is way more likely to hire you in the future when they realize you are a music or a musician because you're someone who they actually care about. It's very different to connect with people on a human level than to look at them as a potential recipient of your business card. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, like it comes back to that trust element as well where I was saying about like how who depend my rates and everything will depend on who I'm working with because if it's someone who's just said, like, hi, I'm such and such and put a business card in my face, it's like you can just, there's no connection there. Like, I don't know who you are. Um, and yeah, like, uh, if you go to these events, uh, you can obviously take a business card with you, but it's much more interesting to, like, follow them on Twitter and actually pay attention to what they do and show an interest and build that, you can build that relationship over Twitter over time, just, mm. you know? Yeah, one... To, to, to jump on top of that, it's so valuable to come to the events, show your face, um, remind people like, hi, I'm here, I'm part of this industry. 
uh, so signaling like, yes, I'm passionate about this world, I'm passionate about this community, uh, you know, really making sure that, um, you know, people remember you. Um, you know, if, if you have the luxury to go to more than, um, you know, Melbourne International Games Week, if you're able to go to Gamescom, EGS, GDC, E3, and make those kind of connections there in the international market, it's super valuable. But of course, it is absolutely a very expensive investment into your mm -hmm. own career. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to it's hard to figure out like whether like that is absolutely valuable. Like, okay, spending a week in San Francisco will clock in at about ten thousand dollars. So, <laughs> it's not um, it it is an investment. Um, and aspiring to have that kind of capacity to invest in your own career is valuable, but it is absolutely um, not necessary, I think. There are also game jams as well. They're mm -hmm. an important part of it, not just mm -hmm. the huge conventions. If you actually like find the meetups and the communities and the people that are alre already making games mm -hmm. that might consider themselves aspiring, <laughs> like you could all grow together there um, and definitely get like a lot of experience that is going to be hugely valuable uh, in working in a team to like make a game. So you just, sorry Mason, you just said something, you can grow together. I think yeah. that that's a really interesting point because, you know, in, you know, in the creative industries generally, you generally find these, um, you know, talent growing together, you yeah. know, side by side, working together and in, in symbiosis. It's, it's quite a great thing. So you're, you're totally right about yeah. that. I just wanted to poke at one thing that Sebastian said and really reinforce it. Um, one of the, I think, general talking points that we've really kept going over in this panel is that you're not just a musician, you are a business and you have to look at it like that. Um, if you operate any kind of business from the perspective of I'm going to have zero budget, I'm not going to invest any money into it and we'll just see what happens, um, you know, good luck for launching a restaurant from that particular perspective. You are a business and there are going to be costs associated with everything that you do to try and get your business going. That doesn't mean that you need to be spending money willy-nilly, it doesn't mean you can't be bootstrapping, um, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do cost value analyses of everything you consider investing in. But remember that, you know, no one is going to invest in you if you won't invest in yourself. If you don't have that trust in yourself to believe that it's worth spending money on improving your skill set, improving your connections, improving your status, no one else is going to assume that you're going to be worth the money to spend on to invest their multi-million dollar project into your talent. So there's more yes. to invest in than just new gear? That's most of it, okay. but <laughs> I didn't, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna kind of sidestep here, but uh, as a business, you need to provide value as well. And games industry don't actually realize that they need people in music industry. They don't, I mean, in, in the context of like what music industry is as a whole, I mean, of course, games need music and they'll, they'll selectively go, this person or this song or whatever, and then bring that on into their game, but they don't know that they need music industry. So it's kind of your job as music industry people, you know, uh, going back to the question of how do we collaborate, it's really how do you provide value for the games industry? And there are so many different ways you can, uh, and you can't force it on people. You can't like force a customer to, uh, someone to be a customer, right? You have to entice them and you have to intrigue them and you have to explain this is a good thing and then or let them realize that. So whatever you're doing from a music industry perspective, you just have to give them the opportunity to go, oh, I do want that. And then they'll come to you at that point. And so we have some game developers in the room. If we flip that question around, how do game developers find the right composer? It's very easy. As someone who hires a lot of composers, um, Talk to them about the things that you like. It's the exact same thing from the other perspective. Uh, the classic example that I used to use when I would be hiring musicians for like touring stuff or acts like that is like, well, who do you want to sit in a non-air conditioned bus for 12 hours with? Like, who can you stand being with? Start from there and then build up on the relationship. Who do you actively enjoy spending time with? 
who looks at creative things the same way you do? Who do you feel sees your vision the same way that you do? There are thousands and thousands of composers who would be perfect for any given job, but there are only a few composers who are perfect for you personally and who have the same kind of personality mesh where you look at things the same way and you have the same worldview. Look for those people who connect with you on that more visceral emotional level and what you're going to find is that you create a better game. If you wanna get a game that's award winning, if you wanna get something that touches something deeper in the audience, that's kind of the secret. Like all of the best uh, game collaborations that have resulted in truly staggering soundtracks have been the result of creators and composers who have that same perspective on art. So, you know, start by being friends where you are able to assess them more directly, where you understand how they feel about these things, and then you'll find it's actually really easy to make the decision. The business side of it is almost ancillary at that point. Or be <laughs> that one developer in Kevin Penkin's talk that said, I need music for a game, and everyone's like, like, it was just nothing but composers in the group, and they're like, what? You can yeah. literally feel the table go. That's a great way to get several shaking, hundred yeah. Twitter DMs yeah. and quite a few <laughs> new followers. That'll work, too, but that's more of, like, a SEO, like, PR thing. Literally um, just tweet, like, I need a composer, hashtag game audio. Okay. I, asked, I was required to tweet that we were looking for voice actors at Tencent. And I've con I continue to receive DMs to this day. Just um, um, if you give an email address, make it a new email address for that purpose. <laughs> it will absolutely flood. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I'll just add one point as well. Um, that even if you're looking for a specific thing, uh, and you follow some people, and you're like, oh, they're a composer, but their work thus far isn't really what I would like. Um, musicians are always looking for the opportunity to do something different because it does get uh, a little tiring whenever you're just sucked into a void and you're always known for this one thing and you can't really branch out. Um, so definitely like give people an opportunity or at least like just ask them to provide you a demo of like what their take on your idea could be. Mm -hmm. as well. Can I just say that I love pigeonholing people? <laughs> So <laughs> really, <sir>. yeah. <laughs> Curtis Schweitzer started out doing um, Starbound, mm. and then I proceeded to get him many space-related games, and now is composing for Halo. So nice. So get <laughs> pigeonholed as hard as you can. Yeah, that's the key to getting Halo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, like I mean, so the thing is, is that obviously, like I'm most known for chiptune music, like with the Game Boy, and that's fine. But I can do other things as well. But my emails are usually like, "Hey, I'm making a game like Super Hexagon. Can you make a soundtrack like Super he Super Hexagon?" I'm like, "Why would I want to do that? That's like I've done that already. Like, uh, what? No, <laughs> you know." I got pigeonholed into anime butt rock for like four years. Oh Did you God. say butt rock? Butt rock, yes. Like that, that's, that's cool actually the genre. Ah, we'll stop. Thank you. Gonna, yeah, let's we, just end there? We, got, we got given uh, <laughs> five minutes, uh, yeah. about Q &A? three minutes yes. ago. So Maybe Q and A. Uh, pardon. Maybe Q and A. Yeah. So let's. Uh, does anyone have any questions? So my goal was always to be a composer. However, I knew that uh, at that stage, certainly, I did not have the requisite skill set to be getting gigs as a composer. I'll, I'll be super blunt. I was a terrible composer when I graduated college. Um, and there are reasons why I didn't get hired immediately. But I was a competent cello player and recording artist. And I understood how composers think. I just wasn't a good producer. So I was able to you know, deliver stems the way that they would want it done, even if parts were poorly defined or if there were no parts at all. And I could interpret what they wanted. And I would always try and make it clear once we'd built up a relationship, you know, if it was a composer who I respected, I would be like, hey, you know, I'm working on some tracks. Could you give me some feedback? 
and I would just share stuff with them, and we would go back and forth, and one, it made my music better, and two, you know, I started to get to a point where my music was actually good enough to be working professionally, and they would start saying, hey, actually, we need more help on this. Do you want to come and, like, join the team on this side of things and do it? And I found that that was a fantastic transition point. When you know a bunch of composers, there are a lot of opportunities to be collaborating with composers. And as you do that, you start to amass credits. And the fact of the matter is, when you get to the higher tier of things, we're often not really looking or caring about whether or not you were the most important person on a specific production. If you were involved in it, then that shows that there was trust there. There are people who we can talk to who can say whether or not you were important, even if you were just an additional music composer. Um, at the end of the day, all that we're concerned about is that someone trusted you with a multi-million dollar franchise. That means that you're capable of delivering under pressure, you're capable of maintaining discretion and privacy with regards to company assets and rights, and that there are people out there who are capable of speaking on your behalf to say what it was like to work with you. So, you know, any way that you can get into those projects, at the end of the day, it counts. It's all valid. have some local uh, government bodies such as Creative Victoria, Film Victoria, BMDO, who have brought these two out here. Um, APRA AMCOS sometimes have uh, some grants as well. Uh, yeah, if you talk to um, VMDO, who are these lovely people right here, and Creative Victoria, these lovely people right here, um, ask them and they'll be able to point you in the right direction for that. And there are also scholarships available through organizations like IGDA, oh, too, um, yeah. GANG, Game Audio Network Guild. They do GDC scholars and Game SoundCon scholars. Um, there are actually quite a few opportunities for people coming from either disadvantaged uh, positions or from far places to make it easier for them to get there. Mm. Um, it's not inherently a $10,000 expense. I have personally never spent that much on a trip to San Francisco. Well, I'll, maybe I'll from introduce Australia. you now after this, by the way. I think we've got to cut it there. So. We have one more question. There's yeah, go ahead. Absolutely growing area. Um, the one platform I can think of right now is called The Wave VR or AR. Um, they're combining a lot of uh, AR and VR <coughs> technologies in public performance settings and sort of turning that aspect on its head. Um, we can probably talk a little bit more outside. Uh, I feel like I can talk about this for at least 47 more minutes. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to. Well, yeah. Um, so thank you so much Thanks. to um, all of you for being on this panel today, and thank you for being in the audience. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be right outside the door if anyone has any additional questions to try and answer what we can. <laughs>